All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Reader Meet Writer here with the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance. My name is Wiley Cash. I am a novelist um, living and writing here on the coast of North Carolina in Wilmington. And I am the proud recipient of the Southern Independent Bookseller Alliance's Pat Conroy Legacy Award. And so um, I'm going to be with you tonight, and I'll be joined by Silas House, who has a trio of reissued novels out. But first, I want to tell you just a little bit about what SEBA does and what SEBA's mission is. SEBA represents, it's the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance. They represent and work with over 600 bookstores in the, in the 11 uh, states in the American South. And they provide resources, they talk about new books coming out, they put on events like this. So when you support an independent bookstore in the South, you're supporting the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance. I want to also give you another chance to support your independent bookstore tonight. Uh, during the Q&A, you can enter your questions for Silas or for me, should you have them. Uh, into the chat box uh, on the Zoom call here. And when you ask a question, make sure to mention your name and the home store that you'd like to represent to give a shout out to your store. And I'll mention both whenever I ask Silas the question that you have for him. And another way to support your bookstore, I want to encourage you, if you want to purchase Silas books tonight, which I'm sure all of you will, make sure you purchase them from the bookstore that invited you to this event. So if you got an invite from Malaprops in Asheville, North Carolina, please purchase your books from Malaprops in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, it's a great way to give back to an independent bookstore community that gives us so much. So without further ado, I again, I want to welcome all of you. And I also want to welcome uh, tonight's guest, uh, Silas House. And I want to tell you a little bit about Silas before uh, we hear from him. Silas House is the nationally best-selling author of six novels. Those novels are Clay's Quilt, A Parchment of Leaves, and The Cold Tattoo. Those are the books we'll talk about tonight. Uh, and also Eli the Good, The Same Son Here, which is co-authored with Nila Vaswani, and Southernmost, which uh, a lot of you have read that came out in 2018. He's also got a book of creative nonfiction called Something's Rising, which is co-authored with Jason Howard, and he's the author of three plays. Uh, Silas's work has also appeared in the New York Times and Salon. He's been a commentator for All Things Considered on NPR. He's written for Time and The Atlantic and Ecotone and Garden and Gun and Oxford American. And he's won all kinds of awards and received honorary degrees. And he's way too uh, good and talented to be with me tonight. But nonetheless, uh, he has agreed to be with us to talk about his newly issued novels, um, from Blair Publishers, uh, a nonprofit publisher based here in North Carolina. So Silas, thank you so much for, for joining us and for, for uh, taking time to talk about these books. Thank you. I'm always so glad to talk to you, Wally, about anything. So. <laughs> oh, well, we might just talk about anything tonight. Uh, we'll, we'll just act like we don't have uh, over 100 people staring at us. We'll just act like it's just us. And in keeping with that, I'm, I'm drunk right now. I'm hammered. So it, it, it is just like it normally is whenever I see you. Um, so I want to start talking about Clay's Quilt, which is, is, is your debut novel. And I'd like to hear uh, maybe later on a little bit about your becoming a writer and the process and the dream of becoming a writer. Um, but Clay's Quilt thematically is a novel set in, 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 in your home area in Kentucky. And it's a novel about living in the past while um, trying, it's about living in the present while trying to hold on to the past. And I know that's something that you feel very deeply. And can you talk about your attempts to do that in your, in your own life, to live in the present with an intense awareness of the past and how your attempts to do that in your own life may have bled into the novel a little bit. Mm. Well, I think, <clears throat> I think this is a Southern phenomenon for one thing, you know, this idea of, of the past and the present coexisting. And I think we think about the past in a different way than a lot of cultures do. And I think that is multiplied by a hundred in Appalachia. Um, if you, when you're Appalachian, you're sort of, you're expected to always preserve and to make sure that the culture lives, you know, that it doesn't disappear. Because the, uh, the whole world is telling you that Appalachia is disappearing. And, and 
a lot of the time the hope culture is telling you that Appalachian culture should disappear. You know, you're shamed about being Appalachian or you're shamed about being a Southerner. Um, I, I always say that I think that when you are made to be ashamed of where you're from, it makes you more proud to be where you're from. And so, <clears throat> but at the same time, one thing I always want to do in my books is I want to show Appalachia, the South, in these three books, I really wanted to show them as really complex places. I think too often Appalachia is shown as a wholly bad place or a wholly good place. So it's either like, it's these absolutes that the media often operates in, you know, the Appalachia or the South is precious and romantic, or it's just vile and terrible, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so I really always want to explore that gray area. Um, <clears throat> But I was raised very much to be proud of where I was from. And also I was expected to not leave where I was from. Mm -hmm. And that, that can, that has pros and cons, you know, I mean, some people need to leave. Some people don't. And I don't ever want to judge anybody based on if they leave or not. And I think you can be of service to the place if you stay or if you leave and, but I do think that's something that's important to me is to be of service to the place that, that raised me, that made me who I am. And the way that I try to do that is, is writing. Mm -hmm. Now with Clay's quote in particular, I wrote the main reason I wrote that book was because I, I couldn't find any book about generation X that was set where I was from. Mm -hmm. This was the time of things like less than zero uh, you know, like those Brett Easton Ellis books, that's all about generation X and generation X for, you know, was the only rich kids in Hollywood or New York or whatever. And so I wanted to write a book about generation X living in rural America. And so I think that's what set the book apart and, and got it uh, more attention than it wouldn't have otherwise. Sure. Uh, when you talked about, you know, you're, you were raised with the expectation that you might, that you would stay, kind of the, the, the pressure of staying. And I'm thinking about the scene early in the book where Clay goes back to Easter's house and he's literally just moved a couple of miles away. Um, but they, he goes into his uncle's house and he says something like, I hadn't seen you in forever. And he says, I was here last week, <laughs> yeah. you know, cause there's that expectation. And what really amazed me about this book, and I'll ask you to read uh, if you'd like to it from a, a little bit from it, but how ambitious this was for a first novel, because this really, it, you know, oftentimes debut novels, and this is something that I really like talking to writers about, oftentimes debut novels are really plot heavy um, because we rely on plot to carry the trajectory of a novel. Um, but in Clay's Quilt, you really allow the trajectory of the interior plots of the characters to carry the novel. I mean, you really do, it sounds cliche because it's called Clay's Quilt, but you really do weave this quilt that is complicated over time and relationship and tensions, and there's no overarching narrative. W were you aware of that when you were writing it, or were you just trying to put life on the page as you understood it? Or were you aware that you were writing a relationship-based literary novel? Well, I think, I think that there's a lot to be said for having no idea what you're doing with the first, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that there's some magic in that. Um, and that can go one or two ways, you know, it can go totally off the map or it can really work to the novel's advantage. And with this one, I think that it just worked out that way, you know, that you have these, uh, um, uh, there's a lot of characters who populate the novel and all that, but, the voice is pretty con is consistent throughout and and I really did yes I did want it to be like pieces stitched together that make a novel mm -hmm. and the, the title of the book was always Clay's Quilt you know and um, I think it's the only title of mine that I've had that there wasn't questions about from the publisher so that that title really worked well um, <clears throat> the other part of this is that I had a great editor for my first novel, you know, and I always want to, uh, uh, well, she's edited all of my adult novels, Kathy Pori, so I always want to 
hold her up because I just, you know, I, I feel like I owe a lot to her. Um, she's made me such a better writer. Uh, it, it means the world to work with a great editor. Yeah. Um, and before you read, I'll, I'll ask you to read a little bit. I want to say that, you know, I'm not from rural Kentucky, but you wrote about these people so intimately and so beautifully and so wholly that they just felt so familiar to me. And I think that anyone, no matter where they happen to be from, will recognize a common humanity with these characters. And that sounds so corny, but I mean it really sincerely. I really felt close to these people um, when I, I was reading the book. I, I feel the same way about your work and the way oh, that it thank you. made me understand North Carolina better. You know, I mean, um, yeah, I'll just read a little bit. I'm just going to read the first couple of pages from the book. Okay. We can talk about it if you want to. Um, they were in a car going over Buffalo Mountain, but the man driving was not Clay's father. The man was hunched over the steering wheel, peering at the frosted window with hard, gray eyes. The muscle in his jaw never relaxed, and he seemed to have an extra square-shaped bone on the side of his face. No way we'll make it without getting killed, he said. His lips were thin and white. We ain't got no choice but to try now, Clay's mother, Anna, said. We can't pull over and just sit on the side of the road until it thaws. Clay listened to the tires crunching through the snow and ice as they moved on the winding road. It sounded as if they were driving on a highway made of broken glass. On one side of the road, there rose a wall of cliffs, and on the other side was a wooden guardrail. It looked like the world dropped off after that. They made a sharp curve and the steering wheel spun around in the man's hands. His elbows went high into the air as he tried to straighten the car. The two women in the back cried out, Oh Lord, in unison, as one was thrown atop the other to one side of the car. Anna pressed her slender fingers into Clay's arm and he wanted to scream, but then the car was righted on course. The man looked at Anna as if it were her fault. The women in the back had been carrying on all the way up the mountain, and now they laughed wildly at themselves for being scared. They acted like going over the crooked, ice-covered highway was the best time they'd ever had, and the man kept telling them to shut the hell up. It seemed they lit one cigarette after another, so many that Clay couldn't tell if the mist swirling around in the cab was from their smoking or their breathing. The heater in the little car didn't work, and when one of the women hollered to the man to give it another try, the vents rattled and coughed, pushing out a chilling breeze. Clay could see his own breath clenching out silver in front of him until it made a white fist on the windshield. The man wiped the glass off every few minutes, and when he did, he let out a line of cuss words, all close and connected, like a string of paper dolls. <laughs> um... That's great. Can you, uh, we'll, we'll flash forward a little bit in, in Clay's life with the last question I want to ask you about Clay's quilt. And you've written about this in other places. When, when, when Tom Petty passed away, you wrote a gorgeous um, essay about uh, music and, and the role of music in your life growing up and all night parties with your, with your family and, and just things that you remembered. Um, can you talk a little bit about honky tonk culture in Kentucky, especially with clay and cake and and that whole gang and 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 what that culture means to to young people that 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 people that generation X members who are not from Kentucky may be surprised to learn? Well, I think one thing is I was writing that book in my twenties, and so all we did was you know we worked all week and then on the weekends we we would party from Thursday night until Sunday morning, you know? So I was just writing real life experience. Um, I think a big part of that just comes from living in dry territory. Um, most of the area where I live, you, you couldn't buy alcohol. And so that made it so much more fun to go out and, and drink alcohol and dance all night and all that, you know? And there were little clubs scattered around that we would go to where you could carry your own in or there would be, you know, somebody selling it illegally. And so I think that the, the reason that it's important in Clay's quilt, though, is because he's from a holiness family, Pentecostal, um, <clears throat> speaking in tongues, running the aisles, 
I was raised in the Holiness Church. And when I was first taken to a bar when I was about 16 by my wild aunt who would get me into these places, it really struck me how similar the honky tonk culture was to the holiness culture. You know, the music was very similar, electric guitars, drums, uh, real rollicking music, people dancing everywhere. You know, it was a, a total display of passion in both camps, but, but in our culture, they were really in opposition because one was so of the world is the way we would say it, you know, and one was of, of the church. And so I thought that was a really interesting paradox to explore in Clay's Quilt. Um, yeah. And I mean, as you know, as, as many conflicts as you can have going on in a novel, the, the better. And that yeah. doesn't just mean between the characters, but just thematically too. So, yeah. so, and it's a lot of fun to write about and it's a lot of fun to read. You know, there's a, there's a fight scene in the book that takes place in the honky tonk. I think it goes three or four pages. That is the most fun I ever had writing. Yeah. Write that scene. Yeah. I love the character cake and how much he primps and grooms just to feel desirable, <laughs> you know, uh, just to feel different than he feels during, during the week. I thought that was, that was fantastic. Um, so with Clay's quilt, you were looking around at the contemporary moment and writing about, what you were doing, what you were feeling. Weren't you delivering mail when you wrote that book? Well, uh, I was, I was in, I started the book when I was in college. It took me a long time to write it, but yeah, I was delivering mail uh, probably the last three or four years I was writing it. Yeah. And I was actually, um, <clears throat> I had spent some time on the mail route taking notes, you know, and I would go home and jot down the scene that I had composed that day. And so it kind of went full circle because uh, right after the book came out, a, a woman was standing at her mailbox uh, and I pulled up and I had a parcel for her and she ripped it open and she said, just don't run off because this is your book and I want you to sign. <laughs> it's an amazing oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so with Parchment of Leaves, though, you looked back and can you tell me what compelled you after spending so much time looking around at the contemporary moment? Um, what compelled you to look back as far back as you did to the early part of the 20th century? I don't know. You know, books just come to you, even if you don't want them to. And um, so, yeah, my next book was A Parchment of Leaves, um, set in the early 1900s. So it, <clears throat> it's, it's really ironic because one reason I wrote Clay's Quilt is because I just, most of the books I found about my people were set in the far past and I couldn't relate to them, you know? So that's why I wrote Clay's Quilt. I wanted that immediacy uh, of about my generation. And then the next book that comes to me is, you know, about my great grandparents' generation. Mm -hmm. uh, so who knows where books come from? Uh, this one was very much, I think, uh, I grew up around so many people telling stories all the time. So many family members who were always telling us our family history. And I think I just wanted to gather those as much as I could and put them into a novel. And also my family history is pretty, um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's shadowy, you know, we don't have like, um, heirlooms and genealogy and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of fatherless children in my family, et cetera, you know? And so it's hard to know exactly who you come from in those instances. And so I just sort of was writing my family history and filling in the gaps, you know? Um, I think that's the main reason. Yeah. Well, talking about, you know, stories that you heard growing up and in the novel, Vine is this woman with this incredible power and this, this myth is built up around her that she's so beautiful that she'll, any man who looks at her will, will die from the beauty. Were there stories that you heard growing up uh, in Kentucky that, that, that had that supernatural bent or you had cautionary story, uh, stories or um, creation myths? Did you have stories like that that came to bear on your life or, or your work? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was just, um, it was just a totally supernatural culture it was very common for people to get up and um, talk about the dreams they'd had. And then you know, somebody else at the breakfast table would interpret those dreams or um, in, in, in very lengthy ways. 
and signs and wonders were something that people took very seriously. And I loved, I loved growing up and all that. I mean, um, it's such an imaginative, rich culture, you know, and so there's a lot of that in my books as a result of a lot of that in Clay's Quilt. Yeah. yeah. Does anything come to mind that you heard that you remembered that maybe you told your kids about? Um, well, there's a scene in, I can't remember what, I think it's in Clay's Quilt. There's a scene, I had an uncle who was a great prankster. And one day he was, all, he always loved to scare his sister any way he could. And so he had a horse that he prided himself on how quietly he could move this horse through the mountains and, and everything. And so one day he wrote, she had the back door open uh, cooking. Of course, you know, the kitchen was hot and they didn't have any kind of air conditioning. This was in the 1930s, I guess. And he managed to ride the horse in and ride it right up to her while she was cooking at the stove and the horse put its, you know, uh, uh, it breathed on her neck and scared, scared her. And that was a great family story, you know, that everybody just thought was hilarious. And that yeah. the them had witnessed. And uh, so, yeah, I put that in Clay's Quill. But that's in Clay's Quill, yeah. That's really funny. Um, do you want to read a little bit from, um, from um, Parchment of Leaves? Yeah. But I'm sorry. This is embarrassing, but I have to plug up my laptop. <laughs> sorry. It has started uh, losing battery real quick. It'll take me just a second. Oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. And I can show folks these books real quick. I'm back. Oh! <laughs> But you can show them if you want to. Yeah, Blair reissued these books, and they're just absolutely beautiful. So here's Clay's Quilt uh, with an introduction by Tyler Childers, which is really, really cool. And then um, here's Parchment of Leaves. They're, the books look similar. They have you know, slightly different colors, but the, the, the theme of the artwork is the same. And this one has an introduction by um, our friend Amy Green, uh, who wrote... Uh, Blood Root and Long Man. She's an East Tennessee writer. And then here's the Cole Tattoo. And this foreword is by Silas himself. So these are really just beautifully um, reissued novels. Yes, Blair did such a beautiful job with them. I'm really thankful to the team there. They're great, great folks, a great Southern press. So uh, well, sometimes you just buy books from a, a particular publisher because you like the publisher. <laughs> Blair is one of those. Well, I'll just read just a little bit from uh, early on in A Parchment of Leaves. And this is where uh, uh, Saul, uh, one of the main characters, has just met Vaughn, the other main character. <clears throat> Excuse me. Saul could see the girl standing by the gate from a long way off. The closer he got, the clearer her image became, like a reflection coming together in rippled water. When he could finally see her perfectly, he couldn't make himself swallow correctly. He felt his mouth fill with water. She was sticking her fingers to the vines of small flowers that were tangled about the fence. When she touched them, they exploded in a burst of color and soft petals, touch me nods. She put one long finger out and grazed the flower nervously, as if she were putting her hand out to be pecked by a hen. A thin smile showed itself across her fine face. Her hair was divided by a perfectly straight, pale brown line down the middle of her head. She did not wear plaits, but let her hair swing behind her. It was so long that the ends of it were white from the dust in the sandy yard. She felt his eyes on her and looked up. The whites of her eyes were as clear as washed eggshells. She watched them pass. When Saul managed to get his arms to move and tipped his hat to her, she made no motion and did not change her expression. She looked at him the way someone might examine a tree they have not seen before without having anyone there to tell them its name. She leaned against the fence, her lips tightly clenched. He expected her to spit. The road was quickly swallowed up in redbud trees. Hell far, he breathed. What'd you say that for? his little brother asked. Saul didn't answer. He ground his heels into the horse's sides and they made their way up the old mountain, the petals of the red buds brushing against their faces. Many years later, Saul would catch the feel of this tree in springtime and be transported back to this day. 
Um, so with the final book that, that is reissued, The Cold Tattoo, you return, you kind of go back and kind of go to the middle, the middle space and you tell the story of Aneth and her sister Easter and Aneth is, is Clay's mother and Easter is kind of Clay's default mother. Um, what made you want to go back and round out the tale of these two women? And, and, and for, for context, Easter is the one who has the horse sneak up on her uh, in the kitchen and Clay's quilt. But what made you want to return to those two women? Well, I just couldn't stop thinking about them. And readers really liked those characters in Clay's quilt. And people kept asking me if I would write more about Easter and Anna. And I, I said no for two or three years just because nothing came to me. But then I, I, I started writing a story that was based on my mother and my aunt's relationship. They, they were such close sisters, but also had a mother-daughter relationship. And then I realized, well, of course, that's, of course, they've already shown up in Clay's Quilt, you know. And so this means I suddenly realized that all three books were connected and I just made them the granddaughters of Vaughn and Serena, who were in Parchment Leaves. Right. So it just sort of all came together, and it made perfect sense when it did. Um, so I, I think I know the answer to this, but, but some of our, our, our viewers may not. And I also want to encourage them, if you all have questions, we've gotten a ton of comments. People are eating this with a spoon, Silas. But if anybody's got questions for Silas, make sure in the chat box right there, to, make, to list your name in your home bookstore with your question so I can give them a shout out. Um, but can you talk about the effect that women have had in your life and your portrayal of, of women? You've mentioned your mom and your aunt who was sneaking you into honky tonks. And I think I know the answer to my question, but can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I was, I was raised in a, cult, in a matriarchal culture where the women were the main storytellers. Men tended to be very quiet in, in my family and in my community, in my culture, really, um, of Eastern Kentucky. Um, women were the dominant forces, you know? And, um, and, and I mean, I, I was born in 1971, um, so not that long ago, I like to think, but it was such a different time and world in, in especially around gender roles. Um, and I, I'm not saying that with any kind of romanticism. It's just a fact. Uh, the children were just always with the women, you know, and just very rarely around the men in the community I grew up in. And so when I hear a story come to me, it often comes to me in a woman's voice. Mm -hmm. um, and they were just the main keepers of the stories. And also just, uh, they were such strong forces. You know, they had the best stories about themselves. They were more interesting um, and more fiery and et cetera, et cetera. So I, was, I don't know, I think often I'm just more interested in, in their stories. Yeah. Yeah, and it seems like, I mean, the history of Appalachia is a legacy of strong women with, with strikes, with mining strikes, with environmentalism. I mean, it really is the history of women taking the lead on both domestic and societal issues. So it doesn't surprise me so much to hear you say that. Absolutely. I mean, that's one thing that Clay, or, uh, the Cold Tattoo is about. Women have historically led social movements, social justice movements, right? And mm -hmm. especially rural women around the world. And in my book, Same Son Here, we explore that. You know, one plot line is about these women in India who are fighting to save the trees. And in Kentucky, the women are leading the fight to save the mountains. Um, and so that happens in the cold tattoo. Eventually, these women have to fight to save their land. That's all based on uh, real events that happened when women were uh, lying down in front of bulldozers and coal trucks and all that to, to protect the land. So sure. And if anybody's seen Harlan County, uh, the documentary, I mean, it's all women. They're the ones, you know, taking it. Uh, to the authority in, in that documentary. Um, so here's a, a couple of questions and comments. This first is from Alan Samry. It says, uh, Silas, these readings take me back to my Spalding days uh, and my local bookstore, The Haunted Bookshop in Mobile, Alabama. Cool. Um, 
And then uh, this uh, Lisa says, shout out to Copperfish Buddies in Punta Gorda. I absolutely agree about the myriad lessons learned in Southernmost. Uh, my Florida book club read that for our January meeting. Do you, do you like hearing from book clubs? Do you get a lot of feedback from book clubs in Appalachia or do you get more feedback from other areas in the region or outside the region? Oh, just all over, you know, um, I think that I, I love talking to book clubs and I, anytime that a book club contacts me, I'm always glad to zoom with them um, or Skype or FaceTime or whatever they want to do. If, if I'm not already scheduled for another one, I'm, I'm always glad to do that. So anybody can go to my website and find my email address and ask me and I'd love to visit with them. You're going to, you're going to get lit up here on this comment chain about book clubs. Watch. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, Connie says, I think these three books are very connected to nature. Would you agree? Yeah. And I mean, I just can't get away from that. You know, I was raised outside and I was just always playing and my father worked third shift. And so it was really important for me to be outside. If I wasn't at school, I needed to be outside. Yeah. He, he needed the house to be quiet. And also I, I was just really lucky to grow up in a place where I could just roam freely and when we stayed in the woods and I don't know I just have a deep attachment to the natural world and I never sat down to write a scene in any book unless I have just gone outside um, and gone for a long walk in the woods you know and in fact um, um, most of my books have been written outside as long as the weather allows I write outside the port in my main office always and so I, I ride out there from like, I don't know, late October. Uh, well, from like uh, late March to late October, I'm, I'm riding outside. So I just think that takes residence, you know. Sure, sure. So Travis from Silva, uh, shout out to City Lights Bookstore. He says, Silas, if you could change anything in the trilogy, what would it be? Hey, Travis. Travis is my buddy. Um, I think that in Clay's quilt, I wish that I had a main character who was going to college. I don't think that that's, that isn't as represent, representational as it should be. So I've always regretted that. One of the main characters, Dreama. I was going to say, yeah. Talks about it. I think maybe she does go to college, but I wish it was more in that time period. Yeah, I imagine the book to be set about 1999 or 2000 he would have known more people his age going to college, you know? Uh -huh. And so I regret that. That wasn't intentional. You know, it's just sometimes you miss something. Well, I can hear you and how Clay kind of rebukes her when she says she's getting married. He says, you said you were going to go to college. You know, you said you weren't going to do like everybody else. Yeah. Um, right. So uh, Linda uh, from Flyleaf Books in Chapel Hill and McIntyre's in Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm Pittsburgh. She says, Silas, my fellow Kentuckian. Uh, I've passed Southernmost around to so many friends. I plan to do the same with these. So you're getting some, some Kentucky love from here in North Carolina. And Heather Bell Adams, who is a, a great writer here in North Carolina, page 158 books in uh, Wake Forest and Quail Ridge and, and Raleigh. Heather says, uh, you mentioned your editor. I'm always curious how novels change during the revision process. How did these stories evolve as you worked with Kathy? Well, first of all, I love Heather's work. Thanks for being here tonight, Heather. Um, I think the main thing is, you know, Kathy always just knows how to uh, get it down to its, uh, to its essence. Um, a lot of pruning, you know. She's an old school editor in that she makes every line tighter. You know, there's a lot of line editing, and I really appreciate that. I always want to make my sentences as as good as, you know, as tight as they can be. Um, and she's often a voice of reason, you know, I mean, you spend four or five years with a novel, you, to some degree, you lose your objectivity with mm -hmm. some things and you need somebody you really trust to say, this is crazy. This doesn't work, you know? <laughs> and, and when you trust them, you know, well, the main thing I'll tell you is that a really good editor always has a really articulate explanation for why something doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, I know I have heard editors before who just want you to cut something 
get rid of that or lose that whole chapter or whatever, but they can't really explain why. And so I think that's how she, Kathy's built such trust is, is that she always, she's almost, well, she's always right, you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, yeah. And what you just said about being so close to it, you do become so blind to the emotional tone of what you've written once you think you've already got it set and you might be wrong. And I think you also become blind to the line and you really need somebody to come in there and look at the line and say, you know, you can tighten this up or you can let this breathe a little more because you've looked at it for so long, you know? Um, so Jessica from Northern Kentucky, she says, I have uh, heard you talk about this before, but can you discuss the musical element in your books? Well, that is actually something that I had no idea that, that I was even doing that. And when I wrote Clay's Quill, a lot of, a lot of the reviews and articles that first came out drew a lot of attention to how much music was in it. And somebody wrote it, went through and there are like 75 musical references in Clay's Quill or, you know, some huge number that I had no idea there was that much. Um, I think that's just from being, uh, from a musical family, from a musical culture. Um, and music's just such a huge part of my life, you know. And actually, Clay's Quilt led to, to a career in music writing for me that I, you know, I never uh, even thought about. But because there's so much music in there, I, I started getting offers from magazines to write pieces about musicians. And now one thing that I do that I just really love is I do a lot of anonymous writing in Nashville. I do a lot of publicity campaigns. Um, and so uh, just re I just did Jason Isbell's new album for instance, I've, um, I've worked with uh, this great artist named S.G. Goodman, y'all should look up. She has a beautiful album coming out, Charlie Crockett. Um, th those are the, the last three I did, I think. But anyway, um, I, I think music's really hard to write about. Mm -hmm. I think it was Elvis Costello that said, is it him that said writing about music is like dancing about architecture or something like that? Sure. But it's basically the same thing. And then, so I like that. I always like, I think when you can challenge yourself as a writer, it makes that, that passage of writing better when you're really zoned in on making it the best you can, you know? So it's always hard to write about music, I think. Sure. Uh, we'll take two more questions. We have one from Terry. Uh, Terry's hometown bookstore is Parnassus Books in Nashville. And Terry says, I love that Silas's work always has an underlying spiritual element, not in a religious sense, but in a way that transcends the physical. Is this something you're aware of when you write or is it just who you are? Um, <clears throat> it's just who I am, but I think that the characters that I am drawn to are that way too, you know? Mm -hmm. For instance, in Southernmost, you know, there's a little boy who's creating his own theology. And that theology is sort of the way I survived as a person of faith for a long time, feeling like churches didn't want me until I finally found a church where I felt like I belonged, you know? Um, and so I just think I was raised in such a uh, fundamentalist family and culture there's something real damaging about that, to be honest, but there's also something that is real solidifying as well. And so um, I, I think one way that I um, practice my faith and prayer and things like that is through writing. Mm -hmm. if it's, 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 you know, it's a meditative time. Um, and so it just all seems to gel together for me. Um, I could do one more question, but before I, before I do, uh, I want to give a shout out to Kelly from Fountain Books in Richmond, Virginia. She asked, she was asking if you're a book club member and if so, what do you read? Um, and then I want to give, uh, the last question to, uh, to a friend of ours, Silas Lauren, uh, up in Asheville. Lauren asked home, home bookstore, uh, Malaprops, mm -hmm. uh, Silas, I love seeing a bunch of the Spalding family here. How did getting an MFA and going to Spalding change your work or change you as a writer? Mm. First of all, hey, Kelly, I, I can't see you right now, but I love you and I love your store. And uh, it's been a long time since I've been there, and I hope I can come back sometime soon. Um, you know, I had never been a member of a book club until this past uh, year. We moved to a new uh, 
city. We now live in Lexington, Kentucky. And a great way to get to know people, right, is through a book club. And so we, we are in a book club. Um, and also with a, a small group of really close friends, we just started a pandemic book club. And so um, we recently read They Came Like Swallows by uh, William Maxwell, which is set during the 1918 pandemic. It is so beautiful. It's, it's like a less than 200 pages. I really recommend it. Um, so we've been reading pandemic themed stuff. The other one we read is Kiri. Uh, it's a collection of poetry by Ellen Bright Boy. It's also really incredible. Um, any, anyway, um, you know, I had published my first two novels when I went to get my MFA. And I learned so much in the MFA. It made me such a better writer. And it also made my community so much bigger and richer. And I just think, you know, there's just nothing like a community of writers. You just have an instant bond. I don't know. I remember the first time I met you, Wiley, we were at uh, BEA in New York City at this huge breakfast. Remember that? Oh, yeah. I was going to talk about it in a little bit. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's just like an instant connection between writers, um, especially, you know, I think especially in the world of Southern writing, there's so much encouragement amongst us and we're, we feel real familial. Um, and the MFA program I went to at Spalding University, I just think it's such a, uh, the people there are so generous and giving and kind and you feel like you're part of a family, but at the same time, you get real feedback and real criticism and real construct, you know, it's, it's a lesson in diplomacy. Um, so I, I'm one of those people who I'm a firm believer in the MFA. However, I think that everybody's different. You know, the MFA is not going to work for some people and some people it will work for. For me, it was just the perfect thing. And that reminds me that I wanted to mention, Wiley and I talked about this earlier, one of my mentors at Spalding in the MFA was Brad Watson. Um, and he passed away yesterday. And I just want to mention him um, and tell you that I love all of his books, but his most recent one is called Miss Jane. And I just think it's one of the most beautiful American novels to come out in a long time. And so look for that. Um, and Brad Watson was just, he's a, a brilliant writer and just such a uh, witty, great, generous person. And I'm so glad that I got to work with him. And I'm just so glad that I, I got to know him. So yeah. look for his books. That's what I keep telling everybody, read his books. Yeah, that is, that is a great book. I read it not long after it came out. It is a, a very quiet, very penetrating, expansive, small book. Um, if I can recommend another book for your pandemic book club, Flora by Gail Godwin. Uh, it's set during the polio uh, epidemic uh, in the lead up to America's entrance into World War II. I think that's a really, really great book set in uh, fictionalized Asheville, North Carolina. Um, but before we hop off, I want to say thank you, Silas, for for taking the time to, to do this with me. And we had a uh, hundred people and we had all these, these book, these, uh, these readers uh, hang out with us for almost an hour. And I also want to say uh, that the way you feel about Brad Watson, a lot of people feel about you, you know, you mentioned um, us meeting at BEA and uh, I remember we sat down at the table and I saw you and Mallory was with me and and I knew, I knew who you were as soon as I saw you because you were only a few years older than me, but you had been out. You know, your first book came out when you were, what, 23? I was 29. 29? Well, still, you'd been doing it for a while. And I had known who you were for a long time. And we sat down and, and I was like, oh, my God, Mallory, that's, that's Silas House. Silas House is sitting right there. And you got up and came over and introduced yourself. And I've always thought about that every time I've seen you or see your books I always thought and and thought you know you didn't have to do that and I was a nobody my first book had just come out and you came over and introduced yourself and said some nice things and um told us you were going and Mallory and I were in town and we were like we got to go to all the parties we got to try to do this and you were going to see a play by yourself <laughs> and I just thought that was the coolest thing I heard that was the coolest interaction I had in a whirlwind weekend of super cool interactions. Yeah. 
And uh, so the effect that writers like Brad Watson have had on you, you've had that effect on, on a lot of writers like me. So, so thank you for being such a nice person. The both of us have been really lucky to have been encouraged by Lee Smith, mm -hmm. um, who's you know such a great mentor and encourager of writers. I don't know what we would do with without her. Yeah, the Dolly Parton of American literature. Right. I agree. <laughs> well, well, thank you so much, Silas, and, and just to remind everybody, uh, if you enjoyed hearing about these books, please consider purchasing them from the bookstore that invited you tonight. Uh, or from your local favorite participating independent bookstore. Uh, they drive the economy, they create our literary culture, they drive our literary taste, they, they tell us what to read and they know what's good for us. So please support them in every way you can. And we're gonna be doing these Reader Meet Writer events throughout the summer. I'll be your host for most of them. Uh, so if you don't get tired of me and you're not tired of me already, uh, please come back and join us and check in with your independent bookstores. Uh, and see if they're members of SEBA and see how they can get involved in these events and um, ask them uh, to invite you to them. But have a great night. Thank you so much, Silas, and thank you all thank for joining us so much. Here. Appreciate it. Thanks, Wiley. Of course, man. Hope to see you soon. Absolutely.